Yeah. All right, so Patrick, you're gonna kick yeah. us off? Let me go yeah. ahead and get us live here. Go. Yeah, hey. Let's see, and okay. Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Patrick from the Poison Pen Bookstore, and we're here with another of our virtual events um, after a short break. And um, we're really delighted to have Meg Waite Clayton back with us to discuss her new book, The Postmistress of Paris. And she has signed a, a batch of books for us. And I'll go ahead and put a link to them in the comments field, uh, should you wish to purchase one. And also go ahead and, uh, you know, if you have questions for Meg at any time during the hour, just go ahead and put them in the chat or comments field and I'll be happy to ask them. So, uh, Barbara, over to you. Bonsoir, mes amis. Soyez bienvenue, which is French for good evening, everybody. Be welcome. Um, thanks for joining us. Uh, this is really going to be a wonderful program. Meg has an interesting slideshow that she is going to use as part of her presentation for a book that begins in 1938 and moves us um, through the German invasion of France in 1940 and further, and has a lot of real characters in it um, in various different places in France and in various guises and so forth. Um, and it follows basically Nene Gold, who is uh, an American based on a real person that Meg will tell you about. And then a man named Edouard, who has a motherless daughter. And the motherless daughter, one of my favorite things, has a little kangaroo. And unfortunately, <laughs> it's not a real kangaroo. It's a toy kangaroo. And unfortunately, the little Joey um, has been lost. And so she spends a lot of the book hoping to find Joey. And I think in a way you intended, I'm assuming it's sort of a metaphor for the fact that she's lost her mother um, and really in a way losing her childhood. So much to talk about. So Meg, um, why don't I turn this over to you since you've done this wonderful presentation. Super. Um, Barbara, first of all, thank you so much for having me here. It's um, really, really delightful. Uh, and I want to say hello to everybody here. Um, I don't know about you all, but I'm a writer, which means I spend most of my time um, in my office playhouse with my imaginary friends writing books. Um, so my days during this kind of crazy time have not been very different than they are um, all the time. Uh, but despite my still getting to spend my working days pretty much the same, I miss so many people. Um, and for this book, unlike my previous books, I'm launching without my dad to pour champagne for me. Uh, he passed away earlier this year, so I'm particularly grateful for your company and uh, only sorry I'm not there in person. Um, but so the upside to a uh, virtual event is I can invite you into my office playhouse. Um, so I've positioned my, um, my, um, my camera here very uh, carefully so that you can see kind of the working part of my office. Um, I'm trying to tell you this is the clean part of my office and um, there's if there's uh, there's anything that um, me too actually <laughs> so if there's anything you want to ask about you know just ask away I, I certainly mean to welcome you into my home and my place. Uh, I'm going to talk for maybe 20 minutes about the novel, a history behind it, um, and how I wrote it. Uh, and for that, I'll share some images. And then um, Barbara and I are going to chat and definitely um, ask me anything you want. I'd love to do that. Uh, everything, actually, all the piles are out of the range of my, of my camera, so we're good. Um, so when I first proposed the idea for the Postmistress of Paris, a Chicago heiress converts a French chateau into a safe haven for artists and writers she helps smuggle out of Vichy, France, my literary agent said, with a piano player, we'd have a female-driven Casablanca. Um, the Postmistress of Paris is inspired in part by a real Chicago heiress who moved to Paris when she was not yet 20 and was still living there a decade later when Hitler invaded in 1940. Uh, as Barbara already said, it's, uh, her name is Nane. Um, while most uh, expats fled, um, she stayed, my, my protagonist's name is Nene, uh, while most expats fled, um, the real heiress uh, stayed to try to help smuggle out prominent artists. Um, she rented a ramshackle villa where she has refugees and hosted salons at which they literally hung art in the trees. Um, the real heiress's name was Mary Jane Gold, uh, and she is one part of the inspiration for The Postmistress of Paris, which is a love story about a young heiress, codename The Postmistress, uh, and a refugee photographer hunted by the Nazis. It's heavily fact-based fiction, um, drawing on France's internment of famous refugees, Mary and Fry's real effort to help them escape, and uh, Mary Jane Gold's part in that. But 
it's also, and it really is kind of primarily, the scrapings of my own heart trying to understand what it means to leave, to stand literally at the top of a mountain, look back on a life, people you've loved, the only place you've ever called home. Um, so I'm going to start with two minutes and three images about how I started writing, uh, and perhaps I should warn you that what you're about to see may disturb some of you. Now bear with me while I screen share. If I do this right, you will only see cover. There we go. Okay. So this is me at the Sierra Madre Library circa 1970. Uh, I'm 11 already in my second year of braces and just about to go on that most horrible of shopping trips for a girl not yet in the sixth grade to buy my first brassiere. Uh, we'd moved to LA for six months to a neighborhood without children, leaving me to the mercy of my four brothers and the company of books. Uh, so what I did most mornings was ride my bike to the library where they were having a summer reading contest and all you had to do to win was read the most books. So I, of course, wanting to win, chose short books. Uh, then the librarians began putting books like A Wrinkle in Time and To Kill a Mockingbird in my hands. And in reading those longer books, I began to imagine becoming a writer myself. Uh, so fast forward two years, I'm in the eighth grade, back in Chicago, uh, and I'm asked to stay after school by Mrs. Thompson. Um, I was a good student, but not always well behaved. And there's some chance I was uh, talking during the spelling test that day with my fr friend Colleen Gibbons. Anyway, I thought I was in for a scolding. Um, but what Mrs. Thompson wanted to talk to me about was a poem I'd written, which she wanted to encourage me to, pub to submit for publication. Um, I submitted it to the only magazine I knew published poetry at the time, which was Seventeen, and well, they rejected it. it turns out Seventeen publishes poems by Pulitzer Prize winners, and not generally poetry written in purple ink on line paper by 14-year-old girls. Uh, it was 20 years before I ever submitted anything again, uh, and that's a whole nother story uh, involving late night drinking and one amazingly supportive guy. Um, but in case you don't think that early support meant the world to me, note that I still have this poem I wrote nearly half a century ago uh, with my teacher's mark on it. Um, so that's just a short way of saying thank you librarians and teachers for the way you inspire us. I probably would not be a writer if it wasn't for librarians and teachers. Okay. So again, premise of the Prosmisters of Paris, a Chicago heiress converts a French chateau into a safe haven for artists and writers she helps smuggle out of Vichy, France. Um, both the real heiress Mary Jane Gold and my fictional one, Nane, are actually from Evanston, Illinois, uh, which is the town north of Chicago uh, near where I grew, grew up. Uh, like Gold, my Nane moves to Paris when she's not yet 20 and she's still there uh, when Hitler invades. She joins this effort uh, by Varian Fry, who came literally with a, lit, a secret list um, of notable artists and intellectuals he could get American visas for, if only he could get them um, out of the hands of the Nazis, get the, peop the people out of the hands of the Nazis. Uh, and on his list were artists like Picasso and Matisse and Chagall, writers like Hannah Arendt, uh, Nobel laureates and other great uh, thinkers, some of which it would turn out uh, did not want to be gotten out. Many of the people on Varian Fry's list uh, had been put in internment camps by the French even before Hitler invaded. Um, like Germany, France interned Jewish refugees even before the country fell to Hitler. Uh, they were thought to be enemy aliens, perhaps even spies for Hitler, never mind that they were Jewish and had to flee their homes. Uh, for safety in France. Um, so this camp, Camp de Mille, uh, was an old brick factory before it was converted into an internment camp. And a lot of artists and intellectuals ended up there because of its location uh, in Provence, where many of them have settled. There's actually a little town on the coast called saint ray sur mer uh, which Barbara will no doubt be able to pronounce better than I do. Her French, her French is much better than mine. Um, anyway, it was referred to jokingly as the capital of German literature. Mary Jane did some awesomely courageous things to help these folks get to freedom. Um, a lot of what I know about her comes from this book she wrote called Crossroads, Marseille, 1940. Uh, you might notice this cover is in French. Uh, I'm going to spare you the long shaggy dog story about how it's out of print, print in English, but I managed enough mangled French to buy a copy in Paris. Uh, but let's just say uh, my, you know, 20 minutes in that Paris bookstore store communicating in French should have been a sign of how long it would have taken me to read it in French. Um, so fortunately, even though it is out of print in English, I found a copy in the library. 
The real Mary Jane Gold found and rented a ramshackle villa called Villa Airbel, uh, where a whole group of people working to smuggle re refugees out of France lived together. Uh, they even hid some of the refugees there uh, until they could smuggle them out of France. And uh, one of the things I love about this story was that at the same time as they were risking their lives to help people, they managed to have a ton of fun. Um, among other things, they hosted salons uh, at which they played these crazy games that they made up. Uh, the image here on the left is a result of a communal game they called Exquisite Corpse, uh, which started as a word game uh, and was one of these blind things. If you think about like, I don't know, Mad Libs or something. Um, and then it evolved into a drawing game where uh, people would draw, somebody would draw a head and then blindly without seeing their he head, somebody would draw the body and then somebody else the tail and you ended up with these really bizarre creatures. Uh, anyway, it's very fun. They also, um, developed a deck of cards, which is a pretty famous um, art deck now um, um, called the Jeu de Marseille. Uh, they did not believe in uh, kings, queens, and uh, jacks. It was just too military for them. Um, so they used, uh, they drew geniuses, sirens, and maguses, which no doubt those plurals, I'm no doubt mangling those plurals. But So these salons they held, uh, they often had them out on the Belvedere at the Air Bell, um, and they literally hung art in the trees. Uh, so this is Bene uh, Danny Benedite. Uh, he's one of the real heroes who plays a role in the novel, uh, hanging a painting by Max Ernst, a surrealist who plays a smaller role. And they literally hung uh, paintings by uh, people like Chagall in this uh, in this in these trees. Uh, so this real heiress, Mary Jane Gold, uh, is part of the inspiration for the postmistress. Uh, but my my novel is actually a bit of a mashup. Um, Nene Fly is the same kind of airplane Mary Jane Gold did, uh, which is this red Vega Gold. Um, she has a, an adorable dog named Dagobert. Again, like my protagonist ends up having, although I will tell you that I think my Dagobert is a, a little cuter. Um, but they, uh, both Dagobert's had a funny habit of barking like mad every time anyone said Hitler. Um, sometimes you just can't make it up better than it actually was. Uh, my Nene so my Nene is definitely a large dollop of Mary Jane Gold, um, but I also tossed in a bit of a German refugee named Lisa Fitko. Um, Fitko played a big role in helping the refugees escape, um, but I can't tell you what it is because I don't want to spoil the read. Uh, and there's obviously a lot of fiction in Nene too. Uh, so the postmaster of Pick, oops, sorry, I think I did went, went, went too far. Too, too far? Hmm. There you go. That's it. Okay. So, uh, so the postmistress of Paris is one part of the story of this courageous American woman, um, but it's also the story of the refugee artists who fled uh, Hitler, um, Hitler's uh, Germany for safety in France, only to be arrested and combined in these French internment camps. Uh, the experience of my photographer, Edward, who I called Edward because it's easier, um, who flees the Reich with his toddler daughter, Luki and as Barbara mentioned, her stuffed kangaroo, who's called Professor Ellie Mouse. Uh, only to end up in peril in France. Um, those characters are drawn from the real experiences of men interned at Camp de Mille, children hidden in Paris, and refugees trying to escape over the Pyrenees. Uh, this is the dark part of this presentation. Uh, the men interned uh, at Camp de Mille lived and ate and slept in this old tile factory that was still so thick with brick dust that they described the way it made the floor uneven to walk on uh, and filled their lungs. In what was a true testament to the human spirit, uh, they made what used to be underground kilns um, into little studios to create art in. Uh, they even set up a nightclub of uh, sorts in one of the kilns. Uh, they created art wherever they could, including on the beams, the ceiling beams, uh, on the brick walls. That's also a brick wall, obviously. Uh, and in a camp hall, which just in case you think they're having dinner in the camp hall and breakfast every morning, no, they had all their meals in that room that I showed you earlier, the dusty brick room. Uh, they wrote symphonies uh, that they also performed in a sort of a makeshift theater that they set up in that camp hall. Uh, and the same thing for plays. So they not only wrote uh, them, but also performed them. Uh, and uh, everybody came to see these plays, the staff and even the camp cap captain uh, because these were some amazingly talented often famous men and the shows would have belonged in any of the world's most famous venues um, these photos tend to make camp de Mille look 
cushy. Uh, obviously, it wasn't even under the Free French. Um, but after Hitler invaded, the plight of these people interned here uh, became more dire. Escape became more necessary and extremely dangerous, uh, both for the prisoners and for people like Mary Jane Gold, who helped them escape. Uh, so this story becomes a race against the clock to save lives. A lot of the characters in the book are drawn from real people. And when I stick um, pretty closely to their real lives uh, for their bits, I use their real names. So exa for example, this guy on the top right there is a guy named Varian Fry, who brought the list and uh, established and read the and led the rescue network. Um, this photo, like a lot of them I'm using here, comes from the US Holocaust Memorial Museum, and I'm grateful to be able to use them. Uh, this guy here is Bill Fryer. He was a Viennese political cartoonist who was their forger. Um, and uh, unfortunately, he was caught forging documents and eventually deported to Poland, imprisoned first at Auschwitz and later at Buchenwald and Friesenstadt. Um, he did survive, but uh, I hope that will give you some sense of how dangerous this effort was. This guy here is one of my favorite uh, characters. His name is Gussie Rosenberg. Uh, he was a 19 year old Jewish man who could pass for an Aryan teenager, which as you can imagine was pretty handy back then. Um, he ended up as a liter literature professor at Bard College and he just passed away uh, at the end of October, October 30th at the age of 100. I hadn't known he was alive when I was writing the book and I was sorry I didn't ever get to reach out to him. Uh, this is Leon Fe uh, Fetchwanger, uh, who was a Bavarian Jew and one of the world's most popular writers in 1940. Uh, he had fled the Reich and was um, it settled in San Reis or Mer when a war broke out and he was declared an enemy alien and interned at the camp. Um, this uh, photo is uh, from Camp de Mille now. Uh, it's been preserved as a museum and if you're ever in Provence is well worth a visit. And Andre Baton uh, is one of the writers that this rescue effort saved. Uh, he was French and a Gentile, but his writings were banned and he was wanted by the Nazis. Uh, and so he and his wife and daughter actually lived in uh, Villa Erbel for many months before they could be gotten out. Um, he was the leader of the surrealist movement, uh, and you can tell from this photo, uh, quite a character. Um, so I'll, I'll read you just the opening um, paragraph of the book, so because uh, I know people like to read, and then uh, I'm going to talk to you just a little bit about how I wrote it, so you'll have a little peek behind the, the facade here. Um, so it is uh, Monday, January 17th, 1938, in the sky over Paris. The sky out the glass roof of her Vega Gull was as crimson as the airplane. Beyond the windshield and the gray whirl of propeller, 10,000 tons of iron stood laced against the setting sun. Nene called over the roar of the Gypsy Six engine. Uh, Barbara, I should have you reading this line for me. Uh, La dame de fer à son meilleur niveau. That's the kind of art I love to Dagobert, her sole passenger who wagged his unkempt poodle tail as they circled the Eiffel Tower, the Iron Lady at her best. Um, and that, if, if, um, so when I'm writing that scene, uh, this is what I had in front of me, what you see right there. This uh, this is the actual Vega Goal, uh, picture of the actual Vega Goal, the flight panel that you would see. Somebody sent me um, clips of what it looked like from inside, even as you were flying, so I could see that you see, for example, a lot of propeller. And then because Dagobert is in the passenger seat next to me, um, he's sitting there beside me as I write the scene. Um, I like to... Um, keep as many images as I can around me as I'm, I'm writing um, so that I um, can describe the things accurately and keep them in front of me. Um, so this um, this actually opening scene would be nothing um, without the help of some people. I mean, usually I would, you know, in normal times, I would use uh, having a book open with a flight over Paris in a small plane uh, as an excuse to take a flight over Paris in a small plane or even perhaps, you know, learn to fly a small plane myself. Um, but uh, I didn't know that's where this book was going to open until uh, we were already in lockdown and I couldn't get back to Paris for another research trip. Um, so I turned to uh, turned out to be a friend of a friend whose name is uh, Christopher Keck, um, who set up Nene's path uh, over Paris using a flight simulator and the specs of that actual Vega goal. So I could see both how the plane would behave uh, and what Nene would see as she, for example, circled the Eiffel Tower as she's doing um, in the opening scene or tries to recover from a stall. 
Um, he shared it with me by Zoom and we worked it and reworked it with me so that the flight would uh, seem real and exciting and uh, I would be describing it in language that a pilot would like him would use. And so I'm going to play just 10 seconds of it so you can see, uh, and this is 10 seconds of literally hours of Zoom. So. Eiffel and head over to the arc. Um, we're going to drop down to 800 feet. So we went Eiffel. all we went all over Paris there. Um, and uh, one of the things we went over is the small cascade in the Bois de Boulogne, which uh, Nene dips down to see. Uh, this is me there because, of course, I did manage to get to France. Uh, and I actually spent uh, three months on one research trip and a couple months on another research trip as I was writing this novel. Um, so after Nene lands, uh, she changes from her flight gear into this purple chaparelli jacket uh, on the left. She doesn't like the look, um, so she immediately takes it off for a more classic uh, black Chanel dress, uh, lots of pearls, and uh, this Merit Oppenheim designed chaparelli uh, fur, bra uh, fur cuff bracelet, uh, which is an element that echoes through the story. Um, don't panic if you don't know who Merritt Oppenheim is or even Schiaparelli. I didn't either before I began researching this. Uh, and in the book, I'll either tell you who they are or, if, or the context will make it clear or, and honestly, mostly you don't need to know. And I promise there will be no pop quizzes uh, after the book. Uh, so then Nene in that opening scene rushes off to an opening of a surrealist exhibit that really did open in Paris on the night that it does in the Postmistress of Paris. Um, and so for that, for writing that, I found the flyer. So I had all the details about it. Um, and I found a lot of photos of what it looked like. Uh, so the photo on the top right here is what the courtyard before you enter the exhibit uh, looks like. But in case you think anybody arrived in that car, that's actually a work of art by Salvador Dali called Rainy Taxi, or alternatively, mannequin rotting in a taxi cab. And what it is, is there's a um, female mannequin in the back seat who is uh, sopping wet and covered with live snails. So, uh, and I found a lot of images of inside the exhibit too, including the one on the bottom there. Uh, don't tell the docent, uh, but I took down the real works of art that uh, are hung there and in their place, I uh, hung uh, the fictional photographs uh, taken by my Edward. Uh, in the exhibit, Nene first encounters Edward. Um, so I began to gather information about the kinds of cameras and photo gear he would have used, along with images like this one at the bottom right, um, that helped me understand what uh, photographers do to photographs to, as they're making them art. This is actually uh, on the right is uh, the regular photo, although she looks so perfect that it's hard to believe that's a real person. Um, and then on the left is uh, her, that same photo developed using a technique called solarization. Um, so I gather lots of images around me, but also documents like this interzonal postcard, which for um, for a period of when France was split between occupied and free France, uh, was the only mail people could send out of occupied France. Uh, so later in the novel, this cable uh, is sent from the State Department to Varian Fry, saying basically, stop doing what you're doing, stop annoying the French and Hitler. Um, uh, we're trying to be friendly with them, so just come home. Uh, it was sent to him about maybe, uh, I guess, about a month after he arrived in France. He was originally only supposed to be there for two weeks and bring all these people home. Um, and uh, he ended up staying for almost another year. Um, and I've read enough about this cable that I that I didn't actually even need to see it. Um, but there's something about seeing it uh, that makes it more real for me. Um, so I do try to uh, collect everything I can. Uh, so many of the things I collect, I only use for a moment in the book. Uh, some of them I never use, um, but they put, put me into the world I'm writing about so that hopefully I can put you there too as well titled The Postmistress of Paris, and I hope you'll enjoy that uh, loop around the Eiffel Tower at the beginning. Um, but I'll tell you that uh, it could as easily be titled The Postmistress of Provence, as that's where both Camp de Mille and Villa Arabelle were. Uh, this is me wandering around the Pannier district, uh, which, despite the graffiti, looks way nicer now than it did when Jewish refugees hid in its brothels and underground caverns, uh, and where my nene risks her own safety to help them. And it might even be called the Postress of Chenonceau, this gorgeous Loire Valley, um, 
uh, chateau uh, that literally spans the Cher River, which was the dividing line between occupied and free France. Um, you can see here how it bridges the river, uh, and this bottom picture is the inside that uh, gallery over the the loops there, over the arches there, uh, and it literally those were literally the doors to freedom, or sometimes um, that you can read a little more about it in the book. Um, so I can't remember if I said at the beginning here or not that um, when my agent first uh, uh, reacted to this book, um, she said with a piano player we'd have a female driven Casablanca. Um, so it turns out, yes, that piano playing is involved, um, as are Nazis, cocktails, transit papers, and even lovers who first meet in Paris. Um, but when my agent called me back after I'd actually written this novel, you know, her reaction, her Casablanca reaction was just on a proposal, uh, and she'd first read it, uh, she didn't say anything about Casablanca. Um, she, and, but I'll tell you that uh, the San Francisco Chronicle uh, did actually compare it favorably. They called it to uh, Casablanca if Rick had an artist, artistic bent, which was really lovely. Um, but when what Marley talked about after she read it, um, she shared a story I'd never heard in our two decades of friendship about how her husband, who grew up in communist Romania, learned English by memorizing Arthur Miller's The Incident at Vichy from a cassette tape he had to keep secret so nobody would know he meant to escape, um, which he ultimately did. Um, she said in capturing the loss of home that leaving Europe in 1940 meant, it captured her husband's loss decades later and that of today's refugees. Uh, I will tell you, I've left a lot of homes in my life, uh, never in my native country, never a place I had to flee, and still, it's never easy. You know, we so often judge refugees, you know, what have they done to deserve to live here, without considering the impossible decision to leave even the most dangerous of homes. Um, so I hope you'll read uh, and enjoy The Postmistress of Paris as the adventure story that it is, as the love story it is, and as the story about people managing to have great fun even in impossible times. Um, but I also hope the novel will help all of us understand uh, what leaving a life behind has uh, and will always mean. And I also uh, hope that it does the real people involved in this history justice uh, and that readers will be inspired um, by the story as much as I was inspired by learning the, the, the real story. Um, and that's, I'm going to stop the screen sharing here and uh, come back on and chat with Barbara. Well, thank you very, very much. I love seeing your pictures of the Chateau de Chenonceau where I've been. Um, oh, yeah. And, yep. Um, and it's very moving uh, to realize that if you stand on the North Bank um, and you look, and the the chateau it's like it's a covered bridge essentially that goes across the river and then debouches in the chateau and to recognize what that must have meant for people you know that short bridge to freedom although yeah. you know vichy france was a collaborative um, collaborative government and so you weren't really safe but one of the things to keep in mind when you read this story is that america did not go to war with nazi germany until the end of 1941 after pearl harbor so this book starts in 1938 and much of it takes place in 1940 when America was, you know, not at war with Germany. Um, right. one, of the, one of the things you really bring out well, Meg, I think is just how the will, I think, you know, you can't really understand World War II if you don't know anything about World War I and the will to fight um, just could not be summoned. I mean, the French just rolled over. It was like a month. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, I know the Germans did their blitzkrieg thing and, you know, I've been to, you know, Nazi sites and the fortress of Arkhaus and stuff in, in Norway and, you know, I've been to Budapest. My husband is, comes from a very famous and very wealthy Jewish family. He's a Rosenwald and they spent much of their, um, much of their money bringing uh, family members or, you know, fellow Jews and so forth to America as best they could. Um, right. Although we weren't entirely welcoming, we were not a completely open door for mm -hmm. um, for refugees. So we have visited many, many sites in Europe. I I, I think the most, I mean, I, I've been you know to to Regionstadt and been to um, camps in in uh, the Czech Republic and so forth. But I have the worst time with Budapest for some reason. I just have a terrible time uh, with the Nazi 
museum. And, you know, you often wonder, you know, why that much cruelty? I mean, it was so unnecessary. You know, they'd already won the war, so to speak. Um, and, you know, the, the kind of barbarism that they dealt out really didn't make any sense, if you think about it. Um, and I understand why, you know, when the Russians finally came at them at the, you know, with the pincer movement between Russia and the Allied forces at the end of the war, I can understand very easily why the Russians in particular, because they're, you don't touch on that in this, but, you know, if you look at Stalingrad and some of the other things that happened in Russia, I understand why they met equal ferocity, but that's not what this book is about. This is not one of those super dark books, although bad things happen, as Meg said, it's a love story. Um, and it's a story about art and creativity. And it's really basically a story about survival, I think. It's about the human spirit and how even in the worst of times that people can still laugh, still make art, fall in love, um, you know, care for other people's children, um, help people that you don't even know. Um, right. Escape, any of you might have read Kristen Hanna's The Nightingale or um, Mark Sullivan's um, Beneath the Scarlet Sky will understand, you know, um, it different. I mean, The Nightingale goes over the Pyrenees and Scarlet Sky goes over the Dolomites uh, from Italy into Germany. But, you know, what motivated people to selflessly at the risk of their own lives, you know, help help other people uh, to hide them? Um, it's really a mystery. But what I want to talk to you about, because I just love this, she talks about Evanston rules. This this woman, <laughs> Mary Jingle, is from a suburb of Chicago. I grew up there. I mean, in Evanston? In I Evanston. grew up in Winnetka. So it's oh. Evanston, if you go north, it's Evanston, Wilmette, Kenilworth, Winnetka, and then Glencoe and Highland Park. And so, you know, I'm fascinated with your depiction of Evanston rules, because, you know, I was born in 1940 and I grew up in Winnetka, um, spent a lot of time, obviously, in Evanston as well. And I don't know that I really ever had to face up to what you call Evanston rules. So I want you to talk about them because they shape her. I mean, you know, the, the, she, she is both shaped by them and trying to escape them. Um, she is shaped by them, you know, she, uh, I, I came also from that uh, neck of the woods. Uh, I was uh, not in the swanky suburbs. I, I was in a perfectly lovely suburb. It was called uh, Northbrook, but it was uh, not as uh, high end as, as some of the places. Um, I think when, uh, when, when Mary Jane, well, so Evanston Rules is, is a, a fiction um, that I, um, that I, um, the, the term uh, is my term, um, but it's to describe the, the restrictions, the, the expect, so societal expectations um, for somebody like uh, Mary Jane Gold, who was uber wealthy. I mean, her, her father um, developed a way of heating train um, cars that just made uh, millions of dollars. And so they had a, a mansion in Evanston and then they had a second mansion um, in Michigan where they they, they summered. Uh, and so she is of that class of society that where she, you know, she was expected to, uh, to do things and not do things. And uh, Mary Jane Gold, at least, is somebody who uh, would, you know, she writes in her memoir about um, when she was a girl um, going out with her brother, like, and they would do all these risky things. Her brother was five years older and she just tried to keep up with him. And he, um, for example, uh, took her tobogganing with his friends on this big scary hill that nobody was supposed to go down, but they did anyway. And uh, his friend said, you know, you can't have a girl here. A girl can't do this. And and he said, uh, I think the quote is, is literally, um, you don't know my sister fat so <laughs> you know so i think she was um she was somebody who didn't want to fall into that you know she didn't want to have a debutante party and she didn't want to um uh she was not that in, into fashion and she she wanted to do different things um and uh, i think because she was maybe not particularly well behaved um she ended up being sent the reason the way she got to europe is her parents sent her to a finishing school in italy i think um in an effort to uh polish her in a way that she didn't really want to be polished 
Um, and uh, and it's very clear that the real Mary Jane Gold, when she got to um, Europe, uh, felt liberated from the expectations uh, that were put on her in Evanston. And uh, I think very much found herself there. She stayed there. She finally left. She was basically forced out of France in uh, 1941. This is the real Mary Jane Gold. So uh, no spoilers for the book because the book is not necessarily Mary Jane Gold. Um, and she went back, you know, and then she came back after the war and, um, and she died in France, uh, living on the south coast of France. And um, I think she, you know, she didn't do the things that were expected of her generation, she never married. Um, she never had children. Uh, and so, um, you know, in that way, she she would have been seen as probably a failure by her father, um, who had passed away, you know, when she was, uh, when she, not too long after she came to Europe. But so, um, so that's what Evanston rules on. Got it. Well, I mean, you know, those of us who go back further and remember people like Consuela Vanderbilt, American heiresses who were married off by their parents, in Consuelo's case, absolutely forced by her mother to marry the Duke of Marlborough. Um, American money was very welcome, you know, um, in aristocratic families where money was becoming, well, had been an issue for quite a long time. So, you know, she doesn't fall into that category. Now in the book, you give a reason, uh, which I assume is fictional, uh, why Nana is sent off to uh, the continent, and that is she had some kind of physical uh, thing that uh, where she wasn't menstruating, and her father at first thought, her parents first thought she must be pregnant, um, and, you know, the doctors assured her that was not the case, but it appeared that she would be a person who likely wouldn't have children, um, unless that was a temporary thing. I mean, there's a lot of stress that can cause stuff like that, or, or starvation, or whatever, but anyway, that's the pretext upon which uh, Nane yes. is sent off to be in Europe when these events blow up. Do you have any evidence that Mary Jane was, you know, in anything other than they just wanted to send her to sort of finishing school? You know, uh, I, you know, a lot of what I know about Mary Jane comes from her own memoir, especially about her background and stuff. Uh, and um, and you have the sense from that that she uh, she was uh, less well behaved than she, than she ought to have been. But certainly the um, the uh, that that reason that she is sent is fictional. Uh, I want to say again that uh, while this uh, novel is very much meant as an homage to uh, Mary Jane Gold, who I greatly admire, uh, it is not her story. Um, it is uh, a lot of the the things that she does with uh, Varian Fry's effort. Um, are drawn from the real things that uh, Mary Jane Gold did, um, but um, uh, but it is but but Nane is, is fiction. She is one part, you know, this German refugee Lisa Fitko, and one part uh, Mary Jane Gold, and one huge part uh, fiction. So yeah, right. No, no, I understand that. I just thought it was interesting, you know, that whether you know whether whether just being sent off for polish. I mean. In 1938, Europe was already a mess. And to deliberately send your child to a place where it was perfectly clear that there was, a, you know, a threat rising. Oh, yeah, I actually want to. Um, so actually, both Nene and uh, the real Mary Jane Gold uh, went to Europe in the 20s, in the late 20s. And okay. so and so none. So both uh, Mary Jane Gold, Mary Jane Gold had been living there for a decade. She started in Italy and then moved to Paris and had been living there for a decade when Hitler invaded. And the same thing, uh, you know, that and part of uh, Nene's story arcs Mary Jane's. Yeah. Which makes a lot more sense than yes. what I was pointing out. So you start out in the first paragraph and you, you know, and she's in her gypsy six little airplane, which she yeah, yeah, right. uh -huh. down the road. And uh, the quote is, La dame de fer a son meilleur niveau, which means the lady of iron is at her best level, her best plane or whatever it is, as she's flying around. I really love Dagobert. Dagobert the poodle um, mm -hmm. is a wonderful canine character that goes on about um, goes on through the book. The other thing I thought was fascinating um, because we don't really know as much about maybe the surrealist school as we do about certainly you know the impressionists which were much earlier uh, are perhaps more in our consciousness. So they're in saint -Henri sur mer um, and, and it's an interesting collection. Peggy Guggenheim actually married um, Max Ernst. Yes she did and she, they actually um, 
I, the, there was a lot of speculation that that affair started at Villa Bell while they were they were together. So Max Ernst lived there for a little while before he got out of France. He got out of France, and and I think they um, married when they later on in the United States. But yes, so Peggy Guggenheim was another fabulously wealthy American heiress who found Europe more appealing. I mean, she ended up in Venice, where there's a whole you know Peggy Guggenheim thing, which doesn't have anything to do with this book, but still is interesting. Um, you know, yeah, you can see actually. Yeah, I was going to say you can see um, in in uh, in uh, Mary Jane Gold's obituary in the New York Times, uh, which is you know very few women got obituaries uh, in the New York Times back then, so so that's pretty cool to start with. But then she, they quote uh, Peggy Guggenheim as saying that she gave a vast sums of money to um, Baron Fry's effort, and I, I thought, well, if Peggy Guggenheim is saying it's vast sums of money, then it truly must be, you know, because she had so much money, so. Well, she did. And actually, you know, Nene is able to to do some of her work because she has money and her money is in America. Her father ended up leaving her despite his kind of disapproval or, or at least questioning her, uh, leaves her this beautiful Michigan estate, calling it to my brave girl. But her money was in America, even though she was in Europe, right? Uh, yes. Her, her, money was in her money was. So she yes. could produce things. If nothing else, she could send people to America to draw upon her money there if she was able to arrange that. And, you know, it's it's wonderful when a person a person can be empowered by resources, you know, not it's not only a matter of character, but what can they actually do? And in her case, since she had money, um, she could do a lot that would have been um, out of the reach of many people who were just as brave or just as dedicated, but just didn't have the the wherewithal to yeah. make it work. Um, yeah. And I, it was a, a habit of Chicagoans um, and people on the North Shore to have country places on the east side of Lake Michigan, where it was almost always cooler in the summer than it would be in <laughs> Chicago. Although I can tell you that if the wind shifted off Lake Michigan, you could have a temperature drop of 50 degrees on a summer day. I mean, I can still remember that, you know, we'd be at the beach and everything would be great. And then all of a sudden, it's like an Arctic chill down yeah. to the rest of the lake. But if you were on the east side of the lake, because the wind went that way, uh, you'd be better off. Anyway, there are some amazing mansions over there. Um, did you draw upon a, a real one or did you just imagine yeah. it? Yeah, no, the um, the Marigold Lodge, it's called, was actually the gold mansion. It's uh, outside of Holland, Michigan. It sits out on a point, um, it's surrounded by water and it's, uh, it's uh, really beautiful. It, it actually still exists and I think it's, um, it's uh, Mary Jane, the real Mary Jane Gold did inherit it and she ended up leaving it to um, somebody as like a charitable uh, gift. And it's been um, converted into, as I understand it, like a, a place where you do corporate retreats and, and things like that. And so you can actually rent it out. And um, but it's it seems like it's quite a beautiful place. Well, it plays a role in the book. I don't want to spoil the ending, but um, it does play. A role in the book, even though the book almost well, the whole book takes place till various parts of it in in France. Um, yeah, the only um, the only things that happen in the United States are, for the most part, um, are um, are back you know non a backstory kind of things. Right. Yeah, which is um, fascinating. So I like I like the fur cuff. You know, can you tell us the Scaparelli fur cuff, which for a while really threw me until I recognized that it was sort of a you know, Coco Chanel is famous for her, you know, Chanel things. And also um, she, and, if I remember this right, she and Elsa were actually rivals. They had some kind of a thing that went on. I, uh, and I, I wondered I, if, the, if Elsa's fur cup, so to speak, was kind of a repost to uh, Coco. I'd never, I'd never even thought of it. That's very interesting. It, it may well have been there. Certainly, you know, what I know about fashion design is uh, about this much. <laughs> Mostly what I learned for this book. Right. But somebody um, wrote I, a really interesting book about the rivalry between Coco and, um, or it might have been part of it, or I can't really remember at the moment. You know, I read so much that everything sort of sticks in my head, but they did have a fairly um, intense rivalry. Yeah. And so yeah. um, I'm wondering if, um, if the cuff came from that. But anyway... Um, yeah, you know, if you had a lot of money and you were in Paris in the 20s and up and really up and probably till 1938, you could really live well. You could have fabulous fashion. 
You could make yeah. friends with artists in there. You could eat extremely well. Um, yeah. And, you know, the contrast between that life and the, the swiftness with which the Nazis stormed into France and, you know, shut it down are, are just terrible. Hitler only made one visit to Paris, which I find yeah. really fascinating. He showed up once and then yeah. that was it. Um, yeah. and, and one of the real pot potential tragedies of the Nazi occupation of France and particularly Paris was would they destroy it when they left? And, you know, because that was kind of their, um, their game plan much of the time. But fortunately, and I really don't know why, maybe you do, they didn't. Oh, yeah. You know, as a matter of fact, uh, my, I guess my fifth novel is called The Race for Paris. And it's a right. little bit it's about the liberation of Paris. It's uh, about women journalists in World War II um, who uh, wanted to, were vying to be the first to um, report from the liberated city. Um, but, the, you know, what happened was um, uh, the guy, uh, his name is Van Schultzitz, um, who uh, was put in charge of Paris at the time, um, actually loved Paris. Uh, and so when he, and, and you know, there's uh, there's a lot of debate about you know exactly what happened and how much he takes credit for and does he deserve that much credit and everything. But he basically defied um, Hitler's uh, uh, Hitler's demand that uh, Paris be you know destroyed on the way out um, and and turned it over to the Allies so that uh, it would not be destroyed. Um, and uh, but there's no doubt that uh, other people involved uh, might certainly have followed those orders and destroyed it. So. Um, so yeah, I think that yeah, was just... Yeah, I mean, literally dodging a bullet. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, it yeah. truly was. Well, Nene um, is, it becomes friendly with the family. Um, a family. Um, a husband, young husband named Danny, who mm -hmm. um, gets evacuated at Dunkirk, or at least is up there um, fighting. And mm -hmm. he, his wife is called T, and she's a dear friend of Nene. And they have a little son, uh, Peter, known as Peter Gunn. And um, in, in Nane, much of the book is about that friendship and what Nane is trying to do to, you know, hoping to evacuate Peterkin to the United States and thwart it at every turn. Um, you know, did, did Danny survive at Dunkirk? Is he dead? Um, can his wife find him? And his wife won't leave France, T, the wife, because she, she says, you know, how can Danny find me? If I'm, you know, if I'm gone. So in the book, you, it's really T and, and Peterkin that they keep Nane um, in France, right? Because she did have a couple of opportunities to leave, but she would yes. have had to leave Peterkin behind. Yes. And that, um, that particular section of the book is, uh, is very much inspired by um, the real Mary Jane Gold. Uh, T is a fictionalized version of uh, uh, Theo, who was uh, Danny's wife. Danny's a real person. Um, Danny was the, uh, Danny's family, um, when, when Mary Jane Gold first moved to uh, Paris, she lived with Danny's family. That was her condition. Her father's condition of her being able to go to Paris was that she lived with this proper family, mm -hmm. uh, which she did for a year. And then she moved into her own apartment after her dad died. Um, but um, but so so that is, you know, that little bit of the story and kind of how Nene ends up staying there um, is very, uh, very drawn from um, Mary Jane Gold's real life, very inspired by her real life. The way they, there's some things that are changed, you know, the timing of when they leave uh, France and, and that kind of thing, uh, or leave Paris. Um, but uh, but um, everything, including the path that they take out of Paris and where they go, um, and Nane taking Peterkin, um, Theo turning over Peterkin, and Nane taking him and trying to get him out of um, out of France is uh, is drawn from um, Mary Jane Gold's real life. is inspired by Mary Jane Gold's real life, and I just thought that was a fascinating um, bit of history and look at you know what people did and what people tried to do and uh, honestly how they failed oftentimes in helping the people that they were trying to help. Well, I thought you wrote beautifully about, I mean, I've read other accounts too of the evacuation, people leaving Paris and fleeing for the South, basically towards the, you know, the water so that they could perhaps escape. Um, and, and in the end, many of them wound up, the ones that were successful, going over the Pyrenees into Spain, which was a neutral country uh, or Portugal. Um, and trying to get to the United States. But, you know, luck played such a part of it. I mean, the fact that in your book, 
um, they get hung up in, you know, mud or whatever it is and don't reach the bridge before the, and, you know, it's just luck that they're not there at the bridge when the Germans decide to strafe the bridge and destroy right. people. And, you know, it reminds you of how random violence can be. You know, I mean, you think about war, is the real intent to kill people or, you know, is it, uh, is survival just a lot of it timing, you know, luck being in the right or not being in the wrong place at the wrong time. Certainly that's true on their trip. I think that's true in, in any war at any time. I mean, obviously it's true. I mean, we see this even with school shootings and things like that here, that it's a, it's a fact of life right. that um, luck, but, uh, but uh, particularly in times of war, I think, um, uh, you know, I, I've been studying war since I was in um, high school. I don't know why I'm so fascinated with it, but I am. Um, and uh, and that is one of the things you uh, see again and again. And, and one of the things you see is survivor guilt because people, you know, soldiers, well, you know, you're sitting there and, and you survive and your buddy who was right next to you is uh, picked off by a sniper or blown up or whatever. And I, I think um, that's one of the things that people have a hard time with is, is why am I here and my friends are not? you know, the people who survive. So it's uh, complicated and interesting and um, emotionally complex. And so, of course, that's always, you know, things that we writers are, are drawn to. So. Well, it's, it's true. And it's also true of regular life here at the moment, you know. I mean, there are constant instances now of, you know, violence in public places and schools at the Safeway, you know, at a hotel in Las Vegas, whatever it is. And you know, it's so it's so random, you can't protect yourself, you know, against it. And I'm, I think many of us, many people I've heard discussing it, are almost feeling like, you know, it's kind of a, a wartime situation where you really don't know when you go anywhere anymore, uh, whether violence will find you, and it won't have anything to do with you, it will just be, you made it to the wrong place at the wrong moment. Yeah. And one of the things I think is so interesting, especially about everything that um, happened at Villa Arabelle, is um, that people were living with this um, this threat of it, you know, not being there in you know in the next minute or the next hour or the next day. Um, and their reaction to it uh, seems to have been um, not to flee the danger, but to embrace it and try to help, but also to uh, sort of make every minute count. So they did, you know, they stayed up late partying and they um, they uh, found out that they could get a jazz station all the way from Boston. And so they um, would listen to, you know, they'd crank up the radio after the after they listened to the BBC News, which uh, shockingly, you could be shot by the Germans for uh, being caught listening to the BBC News. Um, but anyway, they would um, roll up the rug and, and dance uh, to jazz music just uh, because they could. And then they would get up very early the next day and work all day, work really hard all day, and then uh, come back to the villa and do it again. And that spirit of making uh, your moments count, I think, is is just really fascinating, lovely, inspiring, makes me um, want to live my life as fully as I can. Well, that's an excellent point. The fact that they went on being creative, making art, taking photographs, you know, whatever it all they did. There, there's some remarkable artists, you know, I mentioned Chagall, there's also Picasso, there's Max Ernst. Um, the fact that they not just survived the war, but were productive, um, right. you know, is a truly remarkable remarkable thing. Why don't we see if Patrick has any questions from the audience? Um, we'll summon him back up here in this <laughs> thing that we can do on Zoom, which I truly love. There he is. Um, I think you've awed them. Uh, it's been a really fascinating discussion. <laughs> trying to see if there are any actual questions. Um, well, uh, let's see. Vicky says, anyone who wants a fabulous book should read Meg's novel the where to go sorry <laughs> uh, the last train to london her writing oh. is fabulous i can't wait i can't now wait to read this new book uh meg does a, such a fabulous job of research while she writes her book um and she goes to say go on goes on to say my question to meg is why as a christian did you decide to write about the jews in the 1940s 
Uh, that's really interesting. Um, I, so I will say that uh, for the last train to London, um, which was kind of the first, uh, what you would think of um, as a, a, a book that would more traditionally be written by um, a Jewish writer. Um, I learned about that story in 2006 or so. My son brought it home, um, the story about the kinder transport. Uh, and my reaction was, wow, this is a story uh, somebody should tell. And so I called up my agent and said, uh, Marley, my agent's Marley Rusoff, and she's Jewish. I said, uh, Marley, there's this uh, just amazing story about the kinder transport, and don't you have somebody who um, should who would like to write it? Um, I can tell them what I know, and I have some interviews that my son did, and blah blah. blah. And um, and she said to me, direct quote. Uh, you should write that story, Meg. <laughs> and I said, I'm a nice little, you know, Irish Catholic girl from Chicago. What am I going to be doing writing that story? Um, and she just insisted. She said, I'm not giving this to anybody else. This is a story you should write. Um, I, I researched that out of total fascination, not ever imagining that it would be a story that I would write, but just because I was fascinated with it. Um, and then in that, um, in that process, I stumbled upon uh, the, the person who turns out to be the heroine of that story, um, whose name is True Spice Miller. Uh, and um, she is Dutch, which I am not, and that prov provides some complications in the research, but she is Christian. Um, and when I discovered that, and the, she played a huge role in the kinder transports and, and then was largely forgotten. When I, when I realized that she was Christian, I thought, well, of course, uh, there are uh, Gentiles involved in this story, in the stories of World War II and helping um, uh, get Jewish people out and that kind of thing. And, and also, of course, it's a story that everybody should know. It's not just a Jewish story. It's a universal story that we should all know. So even though, uh, you know, in many ways, Truce is the most daunting um, character I've ever taken on. Um, uh, it made it that story more accessible to me just just because she was a gentile like me um and then um you know it's interesting i i grew up steeped in um jewish literature my best friend uh, in starting in the uh sixth grade when i moved to um the chicago moved back to chicago after a brief stint in la uh was a, a woman named cheryl cohen now cheryl cohen solomon who still remains a great friend and she uh, introduced me to um Elie Wiesel and just all this great um jewish literature um um Heim Potok. and um so i have been reading that stuff since i was 11. um and so i sort of um i sort of probably know more than your average Gentile about um, about both the Jewish faith and uh, let's just say I went to a lot more um, bar and bat mitzvahs than confirmations when I was a kid <laughs> and had a lot more fun at them. So I think that's how I ended up. I would never have taken on that story if Marley hadn't just beaten me into it, to be honest. Um, she's a great lady and a wonderful agent. And I feel really, really proud to um, have brought a truce and that story into the world. And so thank you so much for, for mentioning it. When I, entered, when I didn't take time to introduce May because we dove right into The Postmistress of Paris. But she's actually the author of seven novels, The Last Train to London, and the Langone Prize honor, The Race for Paris, The Language of Light, which was a finalist for the Bellwether Prize for Socially Engaged Fiction, now the Penn Bellwether Prize, and the Wednesday Sisters, which is when I first met May, actually, was the Wednesday Sisters, when you came to talk about it with me. Yeah, the, so I came, uh, I think, uh, for the Wednesday Daughters, I came to um, Poison Pen in person. It. And yep, that, was, that was the follow-up to the Wednesday Sisters, and it was set in the English Lake country, and so we had a nice chat about that. We did, so. yeah. Um, so, and the other thing I should point out, Chicago is a very vibrant, um, very large Jewish community in the suburbs, again, uh, yep. where Meg and I both, you know, grew up. Um, and so even though we were Christians, uh, we spent a lot of time. Uh, we, we, actually, the high school I went to, Nutria High School, we um, was generally thought to be almost evenly divided between uh, Jewish, Catholic, and Protestant um, enrollees. And, and that doesn't include people of color. It was um, very segregated. But um, at that time, because this was back in the, you know, the late 40s and the early 50s before Brown versus Board of Education and many things changed. So we had, I don't think we had any Asian students. We didn't have, I think we had a very small number of uh, girls of 
girls and boys of color, but most of us were white, but we did have a, a, a very rich religious mix and nobody thought anything about it. No, you know, it was, I think we were, I was in Northbrook for my kind of like my middle school and my uh, high school years. And uh, I, I never give a second thought to uh, my, it was like my friends that were Jewish were in um, Hebrew school while I was in catechism, you know, and we just, um, it was, you just, you didn't think twice about it. So it's, it was kind of a shock to me to um, start to learn about uh, the, um, the, bias against the prejudice against um, Jews throughout history because, you know, they were just my friends. People were just my friends. And True but, enough, you know, anti-Semitism has been rising, which is really distressing from really? my standpoint. Right. Anything yeah. else, Patrick? Yes, there have been a number of questions. We're all curious about your very interesting index card system. Yeah, it's oh. great, isn't it? And the different colors. And uh, can you tell us about that? give you a better view of that. Um, so that is called, wow. you know, I, I call that my uh, card outline. Uh, and somebody I was talking to um, yesterday at my lunch party, uh, called it my, uh, my brain on a board or my brain board or something like that. And I like that description. So we'll, we'll go with that. Um, it is, uh, it is the way I work. Uh, when I'm, um, I'll tell you that that end result, that is the working board for the Postmistress of Paris, and each of those cards um, is a chapter. It has this, this um, book is written, as was the last train, in relatively short chapters in a lot of them. Um, and so, and each of the colors is a, a point of view. So blue is Nane, yellow is Edouard, and um, pink is Luki. Uh, and then each kind of row across is a sequence. So a white card starts a, a sequence of your, you know, if you're into serial TV, you think about like uh, one, um, one episode. Um, so each kind of across is a sequence. And, um, and it's my way of keeping organized. Uh, it's a little, that's actually magnetic paint on a wall and it's, um, and it's uh, attached with magnets. And so it allows me to play with magnets, which is kind of fun too. Um, but it's, uh, when I'm writing, I take a bunch of those white cards and um, I just uh, brainstorm ideas. So I go, I just write down an idea of something that might happen in a book. Usually I do this after I have some sense of what the book is and who the characters are and maybe a chapter written. Um, and then I just write down ideas what might happen. And I write down an idea, I literally throw the card on the floor, another idea on the floor, another idea. Uh, and what that does for me is it turns off the editor on my shoulder who would otherwise be saying, that's a stupid idea. Why would anybody want to read that? Because um, everything I write at some point in time uh, looks like a stupid idea. Um, and other, you know, other times it looks like a good idea. So, uh, so I just do that. And then I take all the cards and I collect them up and I think, well, what if I... You know, is there a way to make a, something like the beginning of an out outline uh, for a novel out of this? Um, and then that gets refined over time uh, and um, until it becomes this. And what I find, you know, one of the other helpful things about it is I find that if I cannot um, describe in a chapter, uh, you know, what's happening in that chapter in a few words, as you can see, none of those has too many words on it, uh, then uh, that's probably true that nothing is happening in that chapter. <laughs> and so maybe that chapter doesn't need to be there at all. And it's much easier to pull a card out and toss it in the garbage than it is to pull out a whole chapter and all that nice prose and everything and throw it away. And so um, so that that helps. Uh, also, I can move things around real easily. So um, so that's a really key part of uh, how I work. And um, and that's still up there because I don't tell my editor yet, but I don't have enough on the new book yet to um, to have very much. So, um, so what I have is, if you look over at that cork board there, there's some cards on the top uh, on the top there, and and that is the new novel in progress, and that's as much progress as there has been so far. So, we'll see. Do you write in longhand or do you do you type or? I. Um, write any way I can. <laughs> so uh, whatever uh, suits me. Um, usually I will uh, start something in my journal just writing because that's um, just for me. Nobody else gets to see it. It's, uh, it's uh, another way of turning off the editor. Um, when I have an idea far enough along, then I will move to the computer and most of my actual writing is done on my computer. Um, uh, but I do also um, generate ideas in my journal and I go for uh, long walks and I used to carry a little um, 
a little piece of paper, you know, folded up piece of paper and one of those little golf pencils or library pencils, which I used to borrow um, from usually from the golf course. But when I was desperate, I would go to the library <laughs> and um, and I would just uh, so if I had an idea, I could write it down. I find my best ideas come when I'm not sitting around waiting for them. Um, uh, and now I just because phones, right, I always have my phone in my pocket. And now I just type myself a little email about my idea or put it in notes or something. So I no longer carry my pencil in my in my um, my piece of paper. But that's uh, I find walking and running very creative time for, for me. Uh, let's see. Andrea asks, uh, do you have a favorite surrealist artist? Um, you know, so here's a dirty little secret. I will tell you, I'm not a huge fan of the surrealists. Um, <laughs> I uh, I love impressionists. If I had to name um, a, a, uh, a favorite artist, it would probably be Barrett Morisot, who is like so far from the surrealists that, uh, that you can't even um, begin to make the comparison. So I find surrealism really fascinating. Um, uh, but uh, much like Nene, who confesses at the beginning of the book that, uh, you know, the surrealists make her uneasy and she make, make her feel like she's not that smart about art. Uh, that's how I feel about surrealism. So yeah. I recognize it as art, but I don't want to live with it. That's uh, so I, I I not, you know, just would not want to. I had a I'm trying to think who it was. I had a print for a long time of a surrealist um, and eventually it made me so uneasy. I got rid of it. I just yeah. was not comfortable with it. Yeah. So some of it's really interesting. Like I find uh, man race photography for, for photography, for example, fascinating. And I am a big fan of photography. So I I very interested in um, what he did, kind of technically, and and that kind of yeah. thing. And and of course, what he did technically sometimes was uh, steal steal Lee Miller's ideas. But um, uh, but I so I find that interesting. But I don't. I'm like uh, Barbara. I, that I can't think of a surrealist that I would necessarily want to have on my on my wall. Well, it's intended to be thought provoking, you know, and yes. um, right. all kinds of things. And, you know, that may well be true, but it doesn't mean that it's necessarily something you want to live with. But in their day, the Impressionists were regarded as the same. Um, yeah. So yeah. You know, right. a lot of us <laughs> just taking the time to get used to it. I noticed that you've got, I meant to mention, at the very back in the author's note and acknowledgments, Meg has put in, it's not a formal bibliography, but the title of quite a few books that she has used in writing this and, you know, they're worth exploring. And I noticed you've got, um, you know, Lee Miller, Man Ray's, um, yeah. like, well, there's there was actually quite a good book. Is it The Necklace that was written about? Um, I, I remember don't... reading it. I don't know. I don't remember what it was called, but anyway, somebody wrote a life of Lee Miller, who was a really yeah. fascinating woman. And, yeah, I've um, read her non. I've read um, you know uh, biographies about her, and I think she's fascinating. And in researching um, the the race for Paris, I read a lot, and uh, I spent a lot of time on Lee Miller. There, that my my photojournalist and my journalist in that story are are not. Um, are, they're fictional, but they're drawn from a lot of research on the real women um, who uh, who reported that war. And Lee Miller is one of the most extraordinary. So I've read uh, Lee Miller's original reporting from the war, and I've seen almost every photograph that she did during the war. Um, but before the war, she did do some surrealist uh, photography. So um, I probably, I probably, if I had to pick up need to wear the um, love interest in this book, the father of the little girl that Nene becomes so attached to is a photographer. And then, yeah. you know, he also paints as this goes along. But, you know, photographers have a particularly interesting way of framing the world, viewing the world enough, which I think makes him a fascinating character. So um, Patrick, is there anything else or shall I wind up? Uh, why don't you go ahead and wind it up? Okay, I was gonna say that, you know, this is ostensibly a wartime novel, but really, in, I think of it more as a love story than anything else. A love story forged in difficult times by people who would never become connected if they hadn't been caught up in the war. There's no way that, you know, that romance would ever have um, flourished or survived. If it does survive, we're not going to have any spoilers here. Um, but, you know, it's a, it's a hopeful book written in a terrible situation, which I think makes us a pretty extraordinary accomplishment. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, you're entirely welcome. So if you've read The Nightingale, An Obvious Analog, or Beneath the Scarlet Sky, or any of these other fabulously um, 
um, stories, uh, very well researched by authors and all, and you're looking for a new one, then The Postmistress of Paris would definitely be your book. Meg, thanks for spending time with us. It's always a treat to see you. Perhaps next book, you can actually come back to the I would love scale. that. I would love well, that. We would too. And thank you for signing our books. For those of you who belong to the notable new fiction club at the Poison Pan, we're not doing formal picks in December, but if we were, this would be our notable new pick for December. So any of you watching it, you might want to order a copy from the store while we still have them. So happy holidays to you and good night, everybody. Thanks for joining us.